Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Pharmacy Cannabis Lecture Series. Each session is designed to deliver a small and in-depth dose of cannabis education. My name is Candace Hawes, and I want to thank all of our viewers and our customers from the Pharmacy Santa Ana, Santa Barbara, and Berkeley for joining us today. In this session, we're going to discuss emerging minor cannabinoids. The cannabis plant contains hundreds of cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids, yet only a handful of cannabinoids and terpenes are widely known. The benefits of the major cannabinoids like THC and CBD are well known, but then we're now beginning to understand that they're and uncover more information about the minor cannabinoids. These less abundant but still very important cannabinoids include CBG, CBC, CBN, and the acidic forms CBDA, THCA, and also THCV and Delta-8. Our guest speaker today is Chris Emerson, um, PhD, who is a founder and CEO of Level. Level is a science-driven company on the edge, cutting edge of cannabinoid research and innovation. Chris is a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces and has proudly served in the U.S. Navy as a Chinese interpreter. Chris holds a PhD in small molecular tech chemistry, um, and he consciously quit his postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford when he realized that academia and pharma was not in his path. Serendipitously, he followed his departure. Following his departure from Stanford, he went to work on a medical cannabis farm in Mendocino before taking a position as a Chinese chemist at a biotech startup. Level was founded in 2015 and is accumulation of Chris's passion for all the small molecular chemistry and the realization that the cannabis plant has a myriad of therapeutic properties that we really know nothing about and that can have a positive impact on people's lives. Level is a cannabinoid company that focuses on providing consistent standardized formulas and creating targeted effects for consuming consumers using unique and rare cannabinoids. Chris and his team have built one of the most innovative brands in the chemist cannabis industry, and I'm really excited to have him with us. Thank you so much, Chris, for being with us today. So, yeah, emergent cannabinoids. Um, what are emergent cannabinoids, right? I think most people are very familiar with THC and CBD. Um, emergent cannabinoids are cannabinoids that the plant produces in small ratios or trace amounts um, that we are just starting to explore. Uh, you know, at level, we've been working with emergent cannabinoids since 2015. And up until probably about a year and a half ago, I used to call them minor cannabinoids or rare cannabinoids. And one of my colleagues, uh, Pamela Epstein, she said, I don't know what you're doing. You should be calling them emergent cannabinoids because they're not minor and they're not, you know, they're not rare. They're just starting to come into their own and become you know, widespread with adoptions, hence emergent cannabinoids. And so uh, she coined that phrase, but I've stolen it from her and I've been using it ever since. So emergent cannabinoids are cannabinoids that the, the plant produces uh, and has produced since the plant has been producing cannabinoids. We just haven't been looking at them because for various reasons, um, especially, you know, the the federal prohibition, war on drugs, the, um, the proxy war for communities of color, the cannabis unfortunately played a massive role for the last hundred years. The cannabis has been pushed into this, this THC market, but it's so much more than that. And so we are now shining a light back onto all these other compounds and mainly cannabinoids that the plant produces um, that are now again coming into their own. So emerging cannabinoids. Uh, THC, CBD need not apply tongue in cheek, but we're all, I think, very familiar with those. They have an amazing place in their use, whether it's for therapeutics or for recreation, uh, but we won't really be focusing on those today. Um, acidics, neutrals, and byproducts. Oh my. So for me, emergent cannabinoids fall into a new, uh, into some subclasses, which I'll talk and discuss about a little bit later on in, in this presentation. And then lastly, it is a bit of a, a bit of an alphabet soup. Uh, there is some tongue twisting nomenclature that is going on in the cannabis industry and it's very complex science. So what does it all mean? And that's what we're going to distill down a bit today in this presentation. So what we'll see is a uh, topic flow. I wanna talk about cannabinoids in general a bit, uh, make sure that we've baseline and have an understanding of, of where we are and where we're trying to go in understanding cannabinoids. We can't talk about cannabinoids unless we discuss the endocannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. It's how you know these molecules function within our own body. And then uh, targeted effects, which I think is really, it's not only the thesis of level and what we do with emergent cannabinoids and trying to formulate for specific or effects-based products, 
um, it, it really is, I think, what these emergent cannabinoids can offer is we really start working with them, study them, understand them better, and formulate products with them. So with that, let's start with the cannabinoid, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Delta nine THC. I think this is the this is it. This is this is the king cannabinoid or queen cannabinoid at, the top, at this point, and everyone is is familiar with it. But everyone may have a different idea of what delta nine THC is. So let's just let's explore that for just a minute. Um, is this delta nine THC? I think a lot of people they would see this image and say, "Yep, that's it. That's weed. That's cannabis." And delta nine THC is the thing that they may think about. Um, if someone has, uh, has, you know, my training or my background, I would look at this and say, hey, that's Delta 9 THC. And I would think about it in a slightly different fashion. I think uh, other individuals in this industry would see this and say, that's Delta 9 THC. That's an amazing cannabinoid. And then finally, I think a lot of people in the industry uh, would think that's Delta 9 THC nowadays. So. So we have this cannabinoid. It's what's been out in the world. It's been studied a lot. We know a lot about it, but it is only one of over 100 different compounds that are produced directly by the plant or that the plant then uh, goes through uh, some chemistry and you can convert into other molecules naturally. So let's look at that. Let's look at the other cannabinoids or the emergent cannabinoids. Uh, so there's three classes of cannabinoids that we understand scientifically. There's endocannabinoids, there's phytocannabinoids, and then there's synthetic cannabinoids. And they all have a place. There's, there's a place for them in therapeutics. There's a place for them in recreation. Uh, I hate using that term, adult use, but you, you guys understand what I'm trying to say. There's a place for it in research. And they all fulfill and satisfy different roles, and they're all important. But today we're really going to focus on two different groups and we're going to focus on the endocannabinoids and we're going to focus on phytocannabinoids. So let's start with endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoids are cannabinoids that our bodies produce endogenously or they're cannabinoid molecules that are uh, biosynthesized within our own bodies. Right now, all of us have these molecules working in different ways in our body uh, with our endocannabinoid system, which we'll touch on. Um, these are the two major ones, uh, anandamide or arachidinoyl ethanolamide and 2-AG, 2-arachidinoyl glycerol. The, these compounds were initially discovered in the late 80s, early 90s, and then we discovered the endocannabinoid receptors, which we'll talk about in a second. So the science of, the science of cannabinoids is still really young. It's in you know, a burgeoning stage. Uh, they still don't teach cannabinoid and ECS uh, endocannabinoid systems in Western medical school and their programs yet. So we have a long way to go, not only where we are in the industry, but also educating uh, the, the, the medical professionals out in the world of, of these systems and, and how important and, imp and impactful they actually are. So endocannabinoids are produced within the body. And the interesting thing about them is if you look at these and I, I didn't, I wanted to stay away from really using kind of molecular shapes because it, they can be out of context, but it's important to understand a small thing here is if you look at these overall shapes, um, you know, you can see this, these, um, you know, not circular, but the almost circular structures on the left, but the areas that I've highlighted in red and in blue, the molecules are identical except for those two regions, but those two regions have very significant impact on the downstream cascade or the biological function of these endocannabinoids. And this is a really important concept because we're going to see it later down the road in phytocannabinoids, which we'll discuss next. But these very small changes to the molecular scaffold of these molecules have profound impact. And when those are um, part of the emergent cannabinoid regime, it, that's where things get really, really exciting. So endocannabinoids functioning in our bodies right now. The other types of cannabinoids are phytocannabinoids. So phyto uh, means from the plant, and these are compounds that the plant produces. You know, uh, over 100 of these are produced by the plant itself. You can break these down into 11 unique classes. Um, I haven't listed all of them here but I've listed the majority of the ones that we actually deal with at level. And I think 
the ones that are out in the world right now that you can actually find products that have these, these compounds in there. So the 11 classes, you've got the tetrahydrocannabinols. This is where Delta-9 THC and Delta-8 THC come from. They're in the same class. They're both psychoactive. Uh, Delta-8 THC has quite a bit less, let's call it half, about half the psychoactivity of D9. You've got cannabinols or CBN, right? And so uh, there's five or six different CBN molecules that are out there. Uh, these, are, these come from the tetrahydrocannabinols or the THCs. You've got another class called uh, the Varens or THCV. Um, and this is a molecule we're, we'll look at uh, at the end of this presentation because it's it's actually a very exciting class of molecules. And they do really, they, they're exhibiting a potential impact for things such as um, metabolism modulation, appetite suppression, things of this nature. Something that a lot of people would say, well, I've tried cannabis before. It either made me tired, it made me hungry or paranoid, so no thanks. And a lot of these emergent cannabinoids, they have completely different, the, the physiological effect that people experience from them is so different than the standard Delta 9 THC experience that it's hard for people to really wrap their heads around it. Um, and it's, it's all new, right? And it's really, really exciting. Uh, you've got uh, CBG, which is the cannabigerol, and we'll talk about this in a, in a minute, but CBG and its parent molecule, CBGA, which is the acidic version, is kind of the stem cell of all other cannabinoids. Every single cannabinoid is made from this one class. Um, it's a pretty amazing cannabinoid. There's some really interesting things that are going on with it. Um, something else I'll touch on a bit after the presentation. Uh, there's CBC, cannabichromine. Um, and then there's a few other classes, and then there's a whole miscellaneous class where no one has really figured out how to classify them yet. And so they all kind of sit in, uh, in this, this one bucket. So at level, we look at things a little bit um, even more granular. And so not only do we have the 11 classes, but we've subdivided them now really into acidics, neutrals, and byproducts. And uh, it's important to understand that you know, when the cannabis plant produces cannabinoids, which uh, I have a slide coming up and so we'll get into it, it produces it as the acidic version. So it essentially has a CO2 molecule that is attached to it. And then through processing, or if you're consuming flour, you're going, you know, you're administering cannabis through inhalation. So you're vaping, you're dabbing, um, you have a pipe, a joint, the energy input that you put into the system to inhale the, the cannabis, it converts the acidics into neutrals and the neutrals are where the psychoactivity lies. And so you can have things such as THCA, which the plant produces, and then we can convert it into the neutral THC. But THCA, it doesn't have psychoactivity, not in the sense of, of a traditional Delta 9 um, THC. Um, it definitely, you feel a physiological change, right? Your body feels good. It can really help ameliorate pain. It can be very good for inflammation, but it, it sands the, the euphoric kind of psychoactivity that most people experience. So for us, the acidics are really, they're very, very interesting because putatively they have a, a ton of therapeutic value uh, without the side effect of psychoactivity. And the really interesting thing about acidics is there's been very little research done on it. And so this is all starting and there's challenges to it, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, then you have the neutrals. Uh, so a lot of the cannabinoids, they're converted through processing or through consumption into these neutral cannabinoids. And then you also have byproducts and the byproducts could be from ingestion. So when you take Delta 9 THC and uh, technology is getting much better and so are products, but when you take in Delta 9 THC through say a traditional edible, it'll get metabolized through your liver. Your liver, liver will convert it into a compound called 11 hydroxy Delta 9 THC, which has more psychoactivity and is longer lasting than D9. And that is what is responsible for the traditional kind of edibles high. You can also do non-enzymatic degradation. So uh, CBN, THC converts into CBN. Uh, and also THC converts into Delta-8. So these are things that just happen over time from sunlight, oxidation in the atmosphere and things of that nature. But they all have very interesting properties and are all considered uh, emergent cannabinoids. 
So I wanted to touch on this. This is this is a very simplified schematic of kind of what happens in the plant, right? So the plant is this amazing biosynthetic machine that produces by dried weight almost 30% of a molecule. And if you you look out into the natural world, that's that's pretty unheard of. So the fact that this pr plant can produce so um, such a high quantity of um, cannabis or in cannabinoids, it, it's actually pretty, pretty amazing. And it uses a highly conserved process, right? So it, it, it recycles a lot of the same internal mechanisms that allow us to use a single input or very a small amount of inputs, one or two, and get to a very diverse library of different compounds. And so, uh, you know, this little green box here, this is geranyl pyrophosphate, but that is combined with something called levitolic acid. It goes through a process that uses uh, a transferase, and then you create CBGA. And CBGA, if you remember, this is this is the stem cell of all other cannabinoids. So then the plant takes the CBGA and it says, "Cool, I'm going to put you through some more, you know, um, biosynthetic machinery proteins, and I'm going to fold you or cyclize you in different ways." And from that, we get to CBCA. And I have the V's in here too. So if we start with something. Uh, if we don't start with a levitolic acid, but we start with something called divarinic acid, then we can get to the whole varin series. And so very simply, you can um, double the amount of cannabinoids available just by changing one of the inputs. Mm -hmm. um, and then these can convert into some uh, the CBT, which are the trials, and these are um, cannabitriol. Uh, or say the plant's like, cool, uh, it's a sunny day and it's 72 degrees. So we're going to make CBDA today. And it takes the same CBGA and it puts it through the same process. And now we have CBDA or the Varin. Um, and then this can convert into um, cannabisitran, which is a very interesting cannabinoid that's, that not much is known about, or the cannabi elsoins, uh, which are also emergent cannabinoids that most people don't know about. But mainly what we're going to talk about is up here at the top where THCA synthase. So CBGA gets gets cyclized into THCA or into THCVA. And then you have both acidic and neutral versions. And then from there, you can make a host of compounds. I've only listed a few here, but Delta-8 can come from there, CBN, Delta-10. You can get different dienes that come out of this. And so, you know, very quickly you get to um, a large library of emergent cannabinoids that then potentially can be used for, um, for therapeutic or adult use later on. All right, so we have all of these, we have all of these molecules that the plant produces uh, and that your body produces, um, but they need some system with which to interact or else there would be no effect from it. And so that is the endocannabinoid system. Uh, the endocannabinoid system is it's phylogenetically ancient right this is they've traced this back to about 600 million years ago it is uh, prevalent in all and in all species in the animal kingdom except for insects and protozoa uh, it's highly conserved so you know again the same way that the cannabis plant likes to take one or two molecules and it can put it through a similar system and create um, a whole bunch of different molecules. The same thing is with the ECS. So across different species, we have very, very similar proteins and protein structure and activity because it is a foundational basis of, of life in the animal, in the animal kingdom, which, which is really amazing when you think about it, that this, this system has been around in animals for uh, 600 million years. And it, it is critical to how we function and, and continue throughout um, you know, just life and, and, um, yeah. So in the ECS, we have two main, two main receptors. Um, these are the CB receptors. Uh, these are cannabinoid receptors one and two CB one functions in your central nervous system or your CNS. CB one is also the, the receptor that is responsible for psycho psychoactivity. And so when you have a cannabinoid and it gives you a euphoric experience or psychoactivity, whether it's delta-9 THC, delta-8 THC, 11-hydroxy, um, um, delta-9, this is all functioning at the CB1 receptor. The interesting thing that for 
all of the reports why there's never been a recorded death from cannabis alone is because there are no CB1 receptors located in your brainstem. And the brainstem is responsible for modulating things such as the, um, the respiratory system. And so since you can't depress the respiratory system through cannabis because there's no CB1 receptors in the brainstem. The, um, and then you also have a CB2 receptor, and this is in the periphery, this is in the PNS, um, and a lot of immune cells. There's there's lots of lists on this, and when you guys, um, or we, as you're watching this, lots of information online and through places like, um, you know, the pharmacy that gives accurate information. There's, there's a ton of this information out there. Um, okay, so the ECS is very important for the interaction of these molecules. But the interesting thing is, is not all of the cannabinoids function at the CB receptors. So for instance, uh, this is a little hard to see, so I apologize, but CBD, right? So you take Delta 9 THC, it functions at these two receptors, gives you all of this action, but CBD, which also has a lot of amazing properties, um, and can be used for things such as helping children with specific types of epilepsy or stress, anxiety. It has very little action as far as we currently understand it at either CB1 or CB2, but it has action at a whole bunch of other systems within the body. And that's important because as you look at emergent cannabinoids, whether we're talking about you know acidic cannabinoids or other neutrals like the Varens or even byproducts, we don't have a really solid understanding of how physiologically they're interacting. Is it solely at the, the CB receptors for the endocannabinoid system? Or are there all these off-target systems um, where interaction is happening? And that's where we're actually um, getting benefit from. So it's, it's very complicated. It's complex. There hasn't been a lot of research that's been put behind it because of the prohibition on cannabis. So this is a very, very interesting and exciting time for cannabis as things open up and people become more aware of this, um, there's a lot more study that's that's going to be happening. And it is very important for it to happen. So we really understand what's happening physiologically. Um, there is implication. So the other part of this too is, this is for CBD, but because of the nature of structure and activity relationships, it's not unreasonable to assume that other emergent cannabinoids will have lots of off-target mm -hmm. interaction. When I say off target, I just mean off outside of the, C, the, the endocannabinoid receptors themselves that we've identified currently. Um, and this has implications later on in targeted effects through emergent cannabinoids. So let's talk about um, getting to targeted effects through um, emergent cannabinoids. You know, it, it starts through having really good genetics for plants that are producing um, high ratios of the cannabinoid of interest. And then it's specific types of extraction and purification, and then finally into formulation. And so uh, the, there was a company in Colorado called, named Ebu, and they, they were around when Colorado went to adult use and was one of the, I think it was the first state to um, legalize and regulate cannabis. And they had a similar idea that Level did, uh, they came out about a year and a half before we did, of effects-based or, or trying to do targeted effects. And they went about it by um, investing in very sophisticated, expensive, large-scale equipment so they could use cannabis that was being grown at that time and try and extract very small amounts of emergent cannabinoids and then combine them later. And they found quickly that it didn't work. It just didn't make sense economically. And it was, it was almost impossible for them to do. And so it became apparent that genetics were the key for us to really access and start um, getting into quantities of emergent cannabinoids we could really start working with and understanding. And now we've seen an explosion of this, right? As the, the Farm Bill came online in 2018, and we see a lot of genetics that have been coming out and people are growing up, you know, massive acreages and fields of, of hemp, as they call it. Uh, it's They're actually drug type plants that have had one of the synthases, the THCA synthase turned off genetically. So then it's not producing THC anymore. It just produces mm -hmm. CBD and CBGA and CBCA. And so, you know, you can go online and you can look up all these cannabinoids and find them in bulk from, you know, well-known suppliers that are reputable and some a lot probably that aren't reputable. 
Um, so the, the landscape of emergent cannabinoid and access to it has changed drastically in the past few years where, um, you know, when we started, when we started this and we were talking about emergent cannabinoids in 2015 and 2016, um, it was next to impossible even to get, you know, a couple hundred grams of, of material from any of the markets because it just didn't exist. Um, and this is great because this is allows us to really push forward on exploring formulation of emergent cannabinoids and putting them into the research that's necessary. Um, extraction and purification for the most, you have it depending on the cannabinoid you look, you, you're trying to access. So if you're just trying to get to a neutral cannabinoid, let's call it THC or THCV, um, you can use standard uh, methods, ethanol, CO2. Most people are using closed loop hydrocarbon. It's very efficient. It's uh, excellent at extracting cannabinoids. You, know, you can do it in such a way that you can be gentle with them. And so it actually works really well for acidics too. If you're trying to isolate acidic cannabinoids, you have to be very gentle with the molecule because the molecules, they want to, they want to decarboxylate. They want to lose CO2. Uh, entropically, this is a favorable reaction because you take a solid one molecule and you convert it into two molecules, a solid and a gas. And the universe says, oh, this is a favorable reaction. So I'm going to push it that way. So these molecules want to convert from acidics to neutrals. And because of that, you have to be conscious of how you go about the methods and the extraction and handling process. Um, so you can maintain, maintain fidelity to the cannabinoid that you want, such as THCA or CBDA. Um, it, it takes uh, quite a bit more skill and um, process to really manage those. And then when you move into formulation, again, not not all formulations. And right now I am I'm really speaking um, more so in a manufactured product. I realize, you know, you could you can uh, consume flour or it could be extracted as the acidics and then you could you could vape or inhale it. Um, you will convert it at that point. So you're not maintaining fidelity because at this point we don't really have technology for inhalation that allows us to um, not heat or vaporize at some point and convert the molecules. Um, so in formulation though, you have to be, you have to be really thoughtful about it as well, because a lot of these molecules will break down over time. Uh, they break down in sunlight with other excipients or ingredients. Um, you know, stability isn't the best. So really the types of products that are used for vehicles of emergent cannabinoids and their formulations is also, is also very important. Um, so that brings us to cannabinoid formulation and delivery. Like th these are critical. And, and really, I think for emergent cannabinoids, it comes down to the fidelity of what it is. What is the effect that we are trying to achieve from a specific cannabinoid? And I'm so I'll come back to THCA again. If I am trying to make a formulation of THCA for someone who says, look, I have I have really bad inflammatory pain and I, you know, this has helped me in the past. If you're trying to make a product that is going to deliver THCA for an intended effect, then it has to be done in such a way that the consumer doesn't end up getting really high off of it because it's converted and it wasn't been done correctly. And they then they have an adverse event, right? It's it's not it's uh, it's not harmful to them, but it's an adverse event because they were anticipating to go through their day, mitigate their pain and use cannabis in that fashion. And they weren't, weren't able to because maybe they ended up unfortunately getting too high. And so cannabinoid formulation and delivery are critical to pushing forward emergent cannabinoids and their use in, um, in product classes and streams. The challenge with it outside of say flour or doing a, a, an extract that is a concentrate is cannabinoids, they're highly lipophilic drug substances, right? So these things really are oil and water. And because they have very little to zero solubility, uh, that severely limits the bioavailability. And bioavailability, um, like I'm showing in this uh, little picture, you know, it's, it's oil and water, it doesn't mix. And there's a reason why um, in pharma, most drugs, I think it's 60% of the drugs right now, are some form of a salt, right? Because salts dissolve in water, they're easy to manufacture, it can be a single compound. Well, cannabis is the opposite of it. It's essentially a, it's a resin or it's an oil. You can get to isolates, but they're still pretty fatty or waxy. Um, and 
um, when you formulate with them, you have to figure out how you get that into an aqueous environment, such as the, the body um, and doing it in such a way that you don't aren't overdosing people, if you will. Right. We're not taking more cannabis than we need, but it is actually effective. So it's a very, very challenging um, uh, problem and issue at the moment. Um, the other thing I didn't uh I'll touch on it in a minute, but I, I want to talk about polypharmacy for a minute, and I don't have a slide on it explicitly, but that's that's the other thing about cannabis and cannabinoids is, you know, polypharmacy is multi-drug components working in concert for a synergistic effect. So the easiest way to think about this is THC and CBD entourage effect. All right. So the, the entourage polypharmacy is essentially the entourage effect as people talk about it and it's incredibly powerful and it works really well and it's kind of the it's the core of what cannabis has to to offer and mm -hmm. so when you're dealing with polypharmacy it's important a that you're getting the right components together and this is a huge aspect of what emergent cannabinoids and where I think emergent cannabinoids are going to move in the future is because it, it isn't necessarily like throw as much as you can at it. Emergent cannabinoids are coming from the point of view of like less is actually more. And if you can be sophisticated in not only your understanding, but in how you're formulating things, you can really have significant impact on this intended effect or targeted effect because there's an understanding that, you know what, we don't need you don't you don't need to throw um you know the kitchen sink at it. it it can be nuanced and it can have a really significant impact that way and part of that as well is in the route of administration and so you know i i'm speaking from this really from the side of a manufactured product and we know that you know flour is a very fast and effective way to consume cannabis but again, you don't maintain fidelity to the acidics. You're getting all neutrals or some byproducts. And so if you want to explore what it's like to have acidics and formulation, at this point with current technology, we can't use inhalation. Um, and so, you know, the different routes of administration are important. And when you choose, what is the delivery vehicle for this emergent cannabinoid formulation that we're going after? Um, you know, everything has a different onset. So inhalation is going to be the fastest onset, most likely the shortest duration. Sublingual is a pretty fast onset, you know, five to 20 minutes for most people typically lasts, you know, an hour to two hours. And then you have ingestion. And this is this takes a lot longer, anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours, depending on the formulation or the matrix that the cannabis is locked up in. And when I say matrix, I'm talking, is it is it a gummy? Is it a tablet? Is it a beverage? So the body has to do different things to different matrices that the cannabis is in. So it can extract the can, the cannabinoids, cannabis, and then get it into the system. So I think as people are looking at emergent cannabinoids and using them in different ways, it's also, it's important to understand the intended effect of what you're going for and how you're going to get there. And a, a very significant portion of that is the route of administration. And then, you know, we've been talking a lot about, I've been talking a lot about targeted effects or intended effect. And it's important that we figure out and develop better process so we can actually validate this targeted effect. And as more and more people, whether it's groups such as Level, if it's people in the cannabis industry, or it's, you know, outside groups in the hemp space or in clinical work, looking at different emergent cannabinoids ratios of them and products we need to understand how we better validate the targeted effect it's it's not enough to just have a cannabinoid such as thcv where i say hey look there's a lot of research out there that says thcv can help um you know uh, function as a hypophagic so it can it can help you change behavior and how you're going to consume you know your caloric intake um, you know, appetite suppression, if you will, metabolic modulation, it can lead to energy enhancement. But if it's one thing to say it and say, oh, look, well, there's a paper and they studied an animal or they studied it in a cell line versus having consumers and patients use it and actually having that effect be the thing that they experience. And that's where we are in the cannabis industry right now and why it can be challenging because you know, you, you only get one time to make a good impression. And so if, if we're not going about this right, I think it really delays the the adoption, the pace of adoption, which is necessary, I think, to really move the conversation out of 
cannabis and cannabinoids, it's all about Delta nine. We're getting high and, and that's not where that's not what it's about for us at level, but it, it's part of it. And we're really trying to push that forward. And that comes down to how do we validate targeted effects and the validation? I think, you know, right now in this industry, in the industry, it's there's a there's a few different ways. I've put three main ones up here. It's focus groups. This, these would be whether internal for an organization or whether external, you know, a group of individuals that can try a product and give feedback on it, taste, aroma, flavor, effect can be a little challenging, but it, it's probably it's the easiest way in. There's several, several different um, apps out there. Um, Relief is one that I'm familiar with that does a great job. This is for patients or consumers who can track their usage. Um, and, and keep that data over time. And they're also developing uh, some quasi, you know, clinical applications. And so you can do much larger groups of individuals and aggregate data and start collecting more rigorous data um, so we can analyze it and then iterate forward as we do formulation for emergent cannabinoids. And then, you know, finally is, I don't have a better word for it at the moment. It's the holy grail of how we get to rigorously collect the data that's peer reviewed that I think has the biggest impact and moves things forward, right? And that's clinical study. Uh, the you know the quintessential example is GW Pharma getting Sativex and Epidiolex through clinical trials and through FDA approval. And that that is where things will need to go for, you know, FDA monographs on cannabis. You know, someday there will be someone who comes out with a formulation and says this has CBN in it and some other things. And we've put it through the trials and we can put a we can put straight on there. This will help your insomnia. But it's a very long and expensive path to get there. And so that's why, you know, that's that's kind of the pinnacle and, and where people are moving towards. And it's necessary for us to really understand what's happening. So validation of effect, it's very important for us as we keep pushing on the boundaries of what effects can happen from emergent cannabinoid formulation that isn't just Delta 9 THC. And there's a place there's a place for D9. It's, it's not going away. It's going to be here for a very long time and there's absolutely a place for it. But there's a whole area that is unexplored in emergent cannabinoids. And, and that's really where, you know, some of us are, are trying to push Finally, I want to I want to end with uh, a case study to, to kind of highlight a, a lot of the things that we we've we've talked about here. Um, it's a THCV case study. Okay, so um, on the left here, I've got a little schematic illustration that shows an unactivated CB1 receptor, and then you've got a, a delta nine THC molecule. And so you know the receptors are this lock and key kind of model. The the receptors is this protein and it's got a pocket in it and the the THC molecule can fit really nicely in that pocket. And then when that happens, it becomes activated and you get this, this glorious event over here that um, you know, you're seeing with the rays come out from it. And when this happens, you get activation, right? This is, this is agonism of the receptor. And so you get, you can get psychoactivity from it. So euphoria inducing there's anti-inflammatory, um, properties for it. There can be antinociceptive, you know, blocking pain signals, and there can also be appetite stimulation, you know, say for people with uh, cachexia or wasting disease. Um, and, and obviously there's, there's lists upon lists and schematics of all the different things that, that cannabinoids can help with, but I chose a few here to, to demonstrate this. So now what happens if we take THC and we take THCV and we put it together at the receptor site? And so here on the left, we've got the same CB1 receptor. We've got the Delta 9 THC molecule. It's, it's ready to go dock. It's once it's like, cool, that's my spot. I'm going in there. But now you've got some THCV and it's coming up. It's like, oh, I like that. That's a receptor spot. I fit in there really, really well. So the THCV, when it comes in, it has a, a deactivation component to it or neutral antagonism. And it changes the shape of the CB1 receptor. And now Delta 9 doesn't bind in there the same way. Maybe it binds a little bit or maybe it changes, but it, it doesn't bind like it did before without the interaction of THCV. And now we've moved to something that's non-psychoactive. There's still anti-inflammatory and anti-nociceptive properties to it. But now we can experience metabolic modulation. We can also look at mm -hmm. hypophagic aspects to it. So appetite suppressant, suppression. And this is... This is all the concepts that we've discussed in this uh, 
rolled into one. It's it's polypharmacy. These are multi-drug components working in concert. These are using emergent cannabinoids for targeted effects and to change and to modulate how cannabinoids are functioning in the body. Um, so uh, this is one of the best case uh, test cases out there that has enough rigorous data behind it to demonstrate that there's there's a whole field to this that we are just starting to scratch the surface on. That's right. That's actually one of the of the first viewer questions that we had. So that's really interesting that that ties into that same study that you guys that you guys did. Awesome. Well, we didn't do the study. It's uh, it was it was a different group that had done it that had published it. But so finally. You know, I want to circle back to when we looked at the the endocannabinoids and we were looking at uh, anandamide and 2-AG and I circled the two little components. Those little changes have very significant impact on how physiologically things are going to happen. So this on the left is delta 9 THC and on the right it's THCV. And if you don't understand molecular structure, that's okay. You can see they're very, very, very similar, except for the portion that I've highlighted with the, the circle. It's missing a two carbon unit. So this is very small. It yeah. takes up no space and you wouldn't think it would have any impact. And it has a massive amount of impact on the nature of the molecule and how not only it has to be grown, extracted, processed, formulated with, but also how it interacts with the, with the system. And so with that, you know, it's complicated, right? But levels gotcha. <laughs> Uh, it's, we are just starting to scratch the surface of what's available and each cannabinoid behaves differently. As I just said, when you, when you cultivate it, when you extract it, when you purify it, when you formulate with it, and then when you're trying to get to a targeted or intended effect, they all function very differently. And so the amount of information we need to research and collect with data, you know, it's going to take a lot of different groups that are working at this. Um, to really have an impact, um, but it, but it's going to happen, right? I think this is cannabis 3.0, 4.0, whatever the next versions are going to be, it's going to be very exciting in the next decade of what we see happen with uh, cannabis and cannabinoids and formulation. So, yeah, I think that's really going to be the future when we really spend time to to research on these different cannabinoids. And that's what I'm really looking forward to one day that we'll be able to tell somebody, you know, we'll do some genetic testing, then we'll tell them, you know, you need so much of of the CB. A THCV or CBG or whatever it may be and be able to provide people um, formulated relief exactly for them, which is, I think, we'll eventually get to that place. If you really look how fast our technology and our innovation has taken off as soon as they've lifted some of these legal barriers, you know, once we completely lift those barriers and we can do these clinical peer-reviewed um, blind studies and really prove like the benefits and the different cannabinoids, um, it's going to be amazing. So just give us 10 years. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I, I think you're spot on Candace. I, and a lot of people, people have been talking about it for a long time, but I, we are going to get to, I think, real personalization. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, whether it's a saliva test or it's like, you know, Everly well, and you prick your finger and they take a blood sample and it understands kind of what's happening with you physiologically. And then as our understanding of cannabinoids and the interaction with the body to dial in. Yeah. It's like, Hey, in the morning, here's your formulation. And in the evening, here's what you get. And, yeah. And then we won't have people having to worry about these side effects because they won't be taking the cannabinoids that they don't necessarily need that are causing these side effects. And and for the most part, would you say that THC is like the main cannabinoid where people experience side effects? I mean, those not side effects for some, for some people are the target. You know, we want to be sedated. We want to be hungry. We want to be um, forgetful. We want to forget things, you know, PTSD yeah. and stuff. Do you think are, are there any other, any other cannabinoids that have side effects that you've found in your research? I, for the most part, it's, it's going to be the things that are psychoactive. So mainly, mainly Delta 9 THC, 11 hydroxy, right? This is much more yeah. psychoactive. So, you know, uh, people don't like that experience. Some people love the traditional edible experience and other people <laughs> like never again. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and I think D8 a little bit, it's been out in the news a lot, uh, mm -hmm. especially in the unregulated space, um, which is dangerous in different ways. Um, but for the most part, the other cannabinoids know from all of our experience and empirical evidence over the past four years of having products on the market, um, no real, the, the biggest complaint we get is I don't think it worked because I didn't feel anything. Yeah. Was, well, that's the point, but did it yeah. help you stress or did you sleep better or, you know, so. 
You know, I always tell people with a lot of these cannabinoids, it's not use it one time and feel the benefit. A lot of time you need to get these into your system and take them for a couple of weeks to a month to really. And then you have to even just look back and be like, over the last month, have I had better sleep? Have I had less anxiety? Have I had whatever condition it is improve slightly over the past? And sometimes it's not till they stop that they realize that they were getting some benefit. That's a that's a fantastic point. You know, cannabis is not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve the problems for people. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people come in like, oh, I'm just going to take this and everything's going to be OK. <laughs> Similar to how I think a lot of people view over the counter medicine or, or pharmaceuticals. But it's not what it what cannabis is intended to do is take the edge off or to allow you to function enough in such a way you'd like, OK, I can deal with whatever I need to deal with now. Now it's behavioral changes. It's patterns in my lifestyle. It's my diet. And so that's what cannabis and I think the real magic in cannabis that's where it's at. It, it has all these other properties can help ameliorate pain and help with chemotherapy and help people cut down on opioids, but it's not a silver bullet and it's a journey. And so people have to go on this journey and really discover what it is that works best for them. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's very important for people to understand that. Yeah. I love that. I completely agree. Um, what do you think is the cannabinoid that has the most undiscovered potential? Like after, um, Delta eight, like, what do you think is going to be like the next big cannabinoid in the market? That's a great question. Uh, I know what I, you know, um, I, I think it's THCB. I was going to say that same yeah. thing. <laughs> it's, I, I, there's so many people come in, ladies are like, I want the cannabinoid that helps with appetite and gives you energy. Yep. Uh, THCV is amazing. I, I, it's my one of, I mean, I have a lot of favorite cannabinoids. I'm going to be <laughs> honest, but um, I, I can, you know, I take our, our sublingual stimulate. I, take it several times a day. It helps me when I need a boost or I need a little motivation. I don't want coffee in the afternoon or, you know, I just need an hour and it's THCV is actually really amazing. And I think a it's, it's becoming more prevalent because genetics are, are getting better. And so we can access it in a greater amounts. Um, and, and public awareness is, is now getting to a point where, um, you know, people are becoming more aware of it. You know, CBN, I think CBN is the one that really knocked the door open. Yeah. We had THC and then CBD came out, especially in 2013 and 2014 when we were using it for, you know, children and trying to uh, benefit children that are having, you know, uh, intractable seizures and things like that. And then CBN came along about 18 months ago. And so we're, we're slowly seeing the barriers get smaller and smaller to people, um, understanding that that there's other cannabinoids out there yeah and getting a new people in the door that never would have used it before you know because a lot of people like you said are just worried about the high side effect you know the psychoactivity so now that we have all these different cannabinoids that can do the job that thc was doing but without the side effects is is really like you said opening the door to so many new people right. um i know that you guys are doing a clinical study can you guys tell us about that yes thank you for reminding me yeah. so you know part of is, I spoke of this was part of the, you know, an ongoing thread throughout the, the presentation of we need better data that's been collected in a rigorous way that, that is accepted into the peer reviewed community, the medical community, the clinical community. So we um, we have a study that's starting on Monday that has a full IRB approval. So an IRB is an independent review board and they are looking after the safety of the individuals that volunteer for these studies. And that's that's a gold standard. Right? If you're going to do any type of FDA trial, it has to be IRB approval or through universities, things like that. So we went through the IRB approval route. Um, it's going, it's a placebo controlled, triple blinded study looking at our CBG pro tab. It's looking at the veterans population to see if this as an intervention can help uh, them if they're having issues with sleep. And so this is our initial pilot study. Uh, we put a brochure in the in the chat screen or, you know, I guess under the handout section. Yes. Um, so this this is fully decentralized. So you don't have to go anywhere. You per, you um, sign up for it if you're interested, if you're a veteran, have issues with sleep and then you go through a qualification process. And then if so, then it can do, be done on your laptop or your mobile device. And it's about five minutes a day total of um interaction that they need to do, followed by maybe an hour once every two weeks. And it's a six week study overall for the participant from start to finish. 
Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited about this. Great. And it's an opportunity to find something like work for them and then also to help other veterans. So that's amazing. Absolutely. That's cool. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> um, all right. So let's move to some viewer questions. Um, what is the shelf life of THCA versus THC? How long does it take THCA to oxidize into decarb? Cause I know it can happen over time, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great question. So I'm going to come back to it depends on the form factor. So if you're talking about just flour, you know, depending on how it's stored, you're going to get conversion of THCA to THC over time. And then uh, THC can degrade into Delta A and CBN. Mm -hmm. If you look at something like a beverage or a tincture, depending on how the tincture is made or how it's stored, um, I haven't done a lot of stability studies on, on other products out there, but you know, it, when you have things that are in solution, they tend to break down quicker because there's more molecular interactions. Um, our, our pro tabs with THCA in them, they're state, they're stable for a year. Uh, so the THCA, there's a natural degradation that happens anyways. Um, so there's a small percentage that's converted over time. And so it really depends on, on the product type and how it's stored. But, but things that tend to be solid uh, tend to have better stability overall versus things that are in a solution phase. That's a good point. I didn't even think about that. The fact that yours are in a solid, you don't have to worry about, you know, if you happen to have it like in your purse or carry it around with you or where you leave it, you know, you don't have to worry about heat, agitation, time, converting Sorry. that. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, another question too is what's the difference between the tablingual and um, what's the two forms that you guys have, the tablingual and the... ProTab. Yeah. Great question. Yes. They look very, very similar. The tablingual is a sublingual tablet. So it's a dissolves in your mouth in, you know, about 60 seconds. Onset is five minutes to 20 minutes. It lasts about an hour. The, the ProTab. So the tablingual is the white box. The ProTab is the black box and that is for oral ingestion. So you swallow that whole with water, you know, you can split in half, but you swallow it onsets 30 minutes to 60 minutes for most people it's about 45 and the duration is much longer anywhere from three yeah. to six hours with the tap lingual is it a, a buckle absorption do you want to put it like up in your cheek and your gum or do you want to put it under your tongue either works either it's works. It, it all goes to the same it's all the same mechanism yeah so it doesn't matter where it's actually dissolved it is important for people to you know make sure that they're they have you know that their mouth is a night is a moist environment so we'd recommend take a drink of water or a liquid beforehand and then swallow and then put it in the mouth. I don't yeah, that, that's a good point. <laughs> and then should people like avoid drinking like afterwards, like any water or beverages, anything like that? Once it's dissolved, it's done. Perfect. It's, you know, the uptake is the uptake is there. There's, you know, there's not a residue or anything like that. So it's been absorbed. Nice. Um, another question. What is the bioavailability of acids? If you eat them, mm -hmm. um, the dried cannabis plant or raw cannabis, um, like a juice. Yeah. Bioavailability for acids for, yeah. For acids or cannabinoids, it's, it's very little, right? I think if you, the dried cannabis plant itself is going to be really tough, right? I mean, this is why in the, in the old, in the traditional days, people would make butter. So they would extract it into the butter and then, or an oil and then heat it to decarb it. Um, I think, there's there's a there's a decent amount of literature out there that talks about potentially making a tea, but you have to be careful with the temperature because you don't want to decarb it. But a raw juice is probably one of the best ways to get um, to get bio, better bioavailability, and also you'll just probably get more quantity. Yeah. Um, some of the other components in the juice itself that are extracted, some of the lipids and waxes, potentially could help uptake um, as as it's ingested. So. Nice. I'm waiting for the one day that we'll finally have a dispensary that has like a, a THCA smoothie, you know, <laughs> it's really like a boba drink where they can make it for you, seal it, and you can bring it home and consume it um, <laughs> one day, you know, um, so many amazing things. Every time I go out into the floor, there's like some something new. So um, yeah. another question, somebody says, we have, we've been learning about the whole plant entourage effect for several, several years. It seems that the science is moving towards more isolate formulation formulations with emergent cannabinoids. Um, he's saying, is this right? And is level leading the way in this research? I don't, I don't know if there's uh, if I'm understanding the question was asking if this is the right thing to do. 
it's kind of like well, the path that's taken. Yeah, yeah, is he saying like that's kind of the way that it's moving and are you kind of you like, guys leading the charge to move it that way in California? So it's it's definitely moving that way and it has to do with the challenges of actually getting to emergent cannabinoid and getting them in the ratio, right? So so the thesis of level is, you know, effects based or targeted effects from cannabinoid formulation. Um, of emergent cannabinoids that aren't accessible for the plant alone. So this yeah. is combining acidics, this is neutrals, and these are byproducts all together in a formulation in very specific ratios. We can't do that through genetics alone. And then we can't do it because uh, of routes of administration, right? And so it's easier with our current technology and understanding, it's much easier to do this when I can source either highly enriched or isolates of different cannabinoids and then blend a specification. Is it, is it correct? I'm not sure. I mean, I think when you look at a whole plant extract, there's a lot of extraneous material in there that may lead to um, some physiological effects that are uh, non-ideal. For instance, when you smoke flour, you're also smoking a bit of plant material and your body actually goes through a pro-inflammatory response because it's trying to get some of this plant material out of your system. So that effect that people get when they smoke flour, although most people be like, oh, I smoke flour and I feel a very certain way, that's the high from cannabis. Well, that's the high from smoking flour for vaporizing. And so each type of product and administration route is going to lead to a slightly different physiological effect. And so um, there's a lot to be said about whole, whole plant for full spectrum or broad spectrum, but in levels estimation, we can get very close to it or we can achieve what we want by using an entourage effect of multi-component cannabinoids and terpenoids, but without the extraneous material that we think may uh, be deleterious to what we're going after. Um, and yes, level is in California and I would say probably in the United States, like we're, we're a fairly unique company right now at this point. Um, we're, we're definitely pushing the boundaries of, of where we think cannabis, the future of cannabis consumption um, for therapeutics and for adult use is going. Yeah, I would agree. And that's why I chose you guys. <laughs> um, I've been getting a couple of private messages too um, on this chat, a couple of people telling their stories and stuff and how they love your guys' products, how they've tried other things really didn't work. Um, so you have a lot of big fans here. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question and um, then we're going to wrap it up because we've, we've taken a lot of your time. We've learned so much. Um, what are the effects of Delta 10 THC? It's a great question. I don't know. I've never tried it. I yeah, think that there yeah. is my assumption. My assumption is it's it's going to be very similar to Delta eight, right? So this is if so. Delta ten is not necessarily a, a natural byproduct, right? You have to use some pretty aggressive chemistry to convert mm. Delta nine into Delta ten. And because of how the molecule gets converted, it's under quite a bit of strain. So I'm not even really sure what the stability of Delta 10 would be anyways. Um, that being said, I haven't tried it and I'm not sure, but my assumption would be because of its where it sits between Delta 8 and Delta 9, it's probably similar to, um, to Delta 8, less psychoactivity than, um, than Delta 9 for sure. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so what do you guys have coming up from level? Is there any secrets or any um, thing that you can share with our audience, like what they have to look forward from you guys? Uh, yes. Uh, we're just getting through final compliance uh, testing on it, but we have a new, uh, it's called the ProTab Plus. So same form factors of ProTab, but these, these are really pretty amazing emergent cannabinoid formulations. So we have one that's called Boost, uh, and this is a high THCV product. Uh, there's there's delta nine in it too, but it's THCV, CBG, and a little THCA. Uh, we have another product called Lights Out. It's THC, CBN, delta eight, CBG, a little THCA. Nice. And then we have a product. So those two will be those those will have some amount of psychoactivity, but the effect is is quite a bit different than what people are going to anticipate. So if someone's like, oh, boost. It's like a sativa. It's not. It, it, it is about kind of like focus energy and um, it's kind of like the st a stimulate, but with a much bigger punch. Okay. And then, uh, and then we have recover, which I'm super excited about. It's CBDA, THCA, CBG, and CBC. 
And it's, mm. it's a pretty fantastic formulation for just, it's like a multivitamin, right? So well-being, it's, it seems to be really good for pain management. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. So those, those are hitting the market uh, within the next three weeks. Nice. Very exciting. So everybody keep an eye out for that. And then we did have some questions too. people asking us about like different products and such um, in the handouts. There is a product guide so you guys can find mm -hmm. information about that. And then they also have a great website. What's your website? It's levelexperience.com. Perfect. And you can get more information there. You guys can email um, a representative that can ask answer your more specific questions. Um, but this has been so informative. I really enjoyed this. You are a wonderful speaker and a wealth of information and very passionate about cannabis and about helping people find the exact cannabinoids that are going to find them relief. So thank you so much, Chris, for being our guest speaker today. Yeah, thank you, Candice. I really appreciate the offer. You know, you've made this very easy. So I really appreciate that. And for the pharmacy for creating this this platform and, and forum, because this is it's paramount for um, for the success of cannabis moving forward. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. And thanks to your team, too, because they were very helpful in getting this all together. You have a very strong team. Um, so I thank you all to our viewers for being with us today. We hope that we were able to provide you some information that will help you become better informed cannabis consumers and that the information that we provided will help you find relief. Until next time, be well and stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody.